This is the story of the four and a half schooner Floors, written by Dave Chamberlain, who kindly gave his permission to make it into a short film. The Floors limped into the Downs on Friday the 6th of January 1911. The Brazilian craft had set sail from Hamburg with a general cargo and a German crew, bound for her home port of Maceo. The Floors had broken a main boom and this was the reason why her long journey to that Atlantic port had been diverted. Within the hour, a dill galley had moored up alongside the little 47-tonne schooner. The master of the floors, Captain Fickle, conversed with the galley's skipper, and he was made aware of the, his ship's predicament. A price was agreed for the galley's charter, and a shipwright was brought out to measure up for the replacement spar. By Monday, the work had been done and the wooden boom had been ferried out and transferred aboard. After the bill had been settled, the skipper of the galley wished the captain goodbye and a pleasant voyage. However, he warned the master that he felt there was a storm brewing up. The weather was bitter and the wind had started to freshen. The German seamen felt cold and their fingers were numb as they re-rigged the sail to the new boom. Captain Fickle knew it was going to be a long and arduous voyage in their small craft so he decided to wait for the weather to moderate. However, by Wednesday the barometer had started to drop and the sudden fall of mercury was recorded to almost an inch. In the early hours of Thursday morning, the 12th of January, the strong southwest wind dropped to a calm. Then half an hour later, through the blackness there was an enormous noise of howling wind. At three o'clock, a northeast gale struck and at daybreak, all the ships that were lying in the downs were straining at their anchors. Tugs had arrived from Dover and were engaged in assisting the vessels that were damaged or in imminent danger of collision through dragging of their anchors. The floors had both anchors down, with a maximum amount of chain cable streaming out through her hawse holes. With the force of the ebb tide and northeast wind combined, the little vessel slowly dragged towards Dill Pier. Shortly before 10 o'clock, her rigging caught onto the gas lamps on the southeast corner of the pier, and in a shower of glass ripped them off. With a small amount of canvas set, the crew of the floor struggled to heave her hankers aboard. When the second anchor was halfway in, the cable suddenly jammed in the windlass. The roll of the small craft was becoming even more violent in the shallow water, and her crew were having difficulty standing, let alone trying to work on deck. Huge waves were crashing against the sides of the vessel, drenching the men. Suddenly the rolling motion ceased. The schooner started to pitch, and her head swung round to face the seas. The anchor had come fast in the rock bank that was adjacent to Dill Castle. The Marne rocks had given floors a brief salvation. The beach had become crowded with onlookers. With the schooner being so close to the shore, the people could see every movement that her crew made. The local coast guards had also turned up, bringing with them their border trade rocket apparatus. The crew of the floors decided that they had had enough. Every one of them was exhausted, and as they were powerless to do any more, wearily they put on their life belts. With the bedraggled ship's cat cradled in one of their arms, they stood, braced against the pitch of the schooner, waiting to be rescued. The lifeboat was already on standby. Her coxswain could see all that was going on as the floors was only a couple hundred yards north of their station. The decision was taken to try and launch the lifeboat. With a head, wind and sea, this would be an arduous task, but nevertheless they decided to have a go. Gracefully the lifeboat slid down the grease woods, but the craft found a receding wave and promptly buried her keel into the shingle beach. The next three mountainous waves hit her bow and slewed her around almost broadside onto the incoming sea. Amongst the cascading surf, the lifeboat crew pulled on their haul off rope, which was attached out to sea by a large anchor. Slowly the lifeboat made it off the beach, set her sails and cleared the surf. The lifeboat coxswain and his crew had the difficult task of tacking into the wind to try and reach the floors. Hundreds of people were on the beach and surrounded the coast guards as they set up their rocket launching equipment. This was the first time it had been used in service for 15 years. With a loud report, the rocket was fired towards the floors, and a cloud of smoke engulfed the crowd. Their aim was perfect, and the missile landed over the schooner just forward of her foremast. The ropes were hauled on board. The first two men were dragged to safety in the breach's buoy. The harness was quickly drawn back to the stricken vessel by the over-enthusiastic crowd. 
They were becoming a danger to the rescue and the Coast Guards were having a job controlling them. Just as the third man was hauled ashore, the anchor chain of the floors parted. The vessel, that minutes before had her head to the sea and wind, was now at the mercy of a storm. The wind whipped the schooner's bell round to a full 180 degrees to the south. The craft wrapped the breech's line around her mast, tearing it free from the moorings ashore. The rope and hundreds of pebbles flew in all directions across the beach, scattering all in its way. The floors, now released from her tether, was dashed ashore in an avalanche of a dirty grey water. The vessel shuddered with every sea that hit her, and waves swept high over her deck. Captain Flickle appeared calm, however, his remaining crewman was distraught and was going to make an attempt to abandon the rolling vessel by jumping into the boiling surf. George Baker, a local boatman, rushed forward, shouting to the men not to move. He ran into the water and threw a rope onto the floors, and the men secured it to the mast. When that was done, the remaining crew member slid down it onto the beach. The captain of the floors made no attempt to follow. George Baker shinned up the rope and spoke to the captain Flickle. After a while, he managed to convince him to abandon his vessel, and as the captain reached the shingle, a loud cheer arose from the crowd. All had been saved, even the ship's cat. With the departure of the skipper, more dill boatmen scrambled aboard the derelict vessel. They made her fast to a nearby capstan, untangled the Coast Guard's tackle, furled the sails and cleared the cordage. When the tide receded, the floors was left high and dry. The boatmen hoped they could refloat her. However, on the next day, Mr Cullen, a shipbuilder from Dover, declared the schooner to be a total wreck. As soon as this was known, the longshoremen stripped her of her cargo and gear. By 10 o'clock that night, there was nothing left of value upon her. On Sunday, her masts were cut away and the hulk was left for firewood.